Welcome back here to uh, Studio One. And uh, I have the distinct pleasure of uh, chairing uh, our next panel uh, with uh, three distinguished guests and performers here at CTM. This is the panel called Bodily Knowledge and Altered States. Uh, it brings together hypnotic techno artist and sound meditation facilitator uh, Lucy, uh, Psychor and Ray veteran Luli, and uh, sonic explorer and composer Jessica Eckerman. So please welcome them to the stage. Uh, and by the way, I'm Graham St. John. Um, so uh, I think what I want to do without further ado, I've circulated uh, some questions uh, among our three guests. And so they're all, it's all like, it's a bit, little bit like uh, uh, cheating on exams. They already know the questions. And so uh, th th my first question was uh, to allow each of our guests to introduce uh, themselves and, and uh, their bit about their backgrounds and um, what their uh, what what their or have performed here at CTM. So I, I think uh, we can just we can start uh, with you with you, Lucy. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, my name is uh, my artist name is Lucy. My real name is Luca Mortellaro. Um, I uh, I am uh, a producer, make electronic music, techno. I run a record label called Stroboscopic Artifacts since 10 years here in Berlin. And uh, since a few years, I run also some uh, sound bath uh, meditation sessions here in Berlin as well, but not only, um, let's say. Um, and today at CTM, uh, uh, later actually, when this lecture finishes, I will, uh, I will lead uh, one of those meditation, se meditation sessions for you guys with the help of uh, that gong there and uh, some deep breathing exercises and kind of trying to bring into this setting what I already do in our more intimate sessions normally. So, yeah. And, uh, first we, we, we can uh, move along to, uh, to, to Jessica. We'll go. Uh, so I'm Jessica Ekoman. I'm a sound artist and a computer musician, I would say. Um, I performed on Sunday in O2 with uh, Andrea Belfi, who is a drummer. Uh, my performances are um, quadraphonic performances, so I use four different speakers spread in space. Um, I would say that in general, uh, in my work, I, use, I work a lot with uh, polyrhythm, different kind of rhythm structure, and also tuning, for example, but also space and uh, acoustic illusions. Um, I also do um, installations from time to time, and I also have a radio show on Kashmir Radio called uh, Open Sources. Yeah, that's an introduction. And finally, Luli. Uh, my name is Vivian Looper, but also the artist named Luli. Um, I would say my background probably started in punk music, but very quickly I realized that making uh, music with four different assholes is really quite difficult. So I started pursuing, how can I make music on my own with just one person, leading me to electronic music. Um, and so over the course of time, I, um, I, I experimented with a lot of different styles before, before sort of um, arriving in the philosophy of um, every single song can be its own unique style, every single artist can have their own unique style. And uh, this is pretty much where I'm at now. Um, I started my own free record label called Anomalistic Records. Um, on the principle that uh, making CDs and um, making really official looking merchandise, although it may be very pretty and make you have a really professional presentation, this really highly limits the music getting to places like Mexico, India, Brazil, and places where shipping would, you know, somebody would have to save an entire month of pesos just to pay for the shipping. Um, and so there was a lot of success in the freeness of that label and also with the lack of um, sort of oppressive creative standards. It needs to sound like this. It needs to be this speed. It's not good enough for us that we just sort of were making an open platform. Um, and so at this point, I, um, I specialize loosely under the, the uh, genre sidecore, but this is something that much like breakcore or noise, it offers you the freedom to really um, explore and, and do things that are unconventional because the audience really craves that experience. 
Um, and so Friday at Bergein, I'll be playing um, at 5.45 in the morning, and I'll be playing a selection of you know, random various styles that I've made over the past 10 years. Um, my, my day job before touring music was a crematory operator. Um, and so there's lots of, there's lots of um, influence from um, life experience. Um, I've, I've been homeless for a long period of time. I've faced a lot of social adversity. Um, and then leading myself to try out, out the career of crematory operator and just having so many really intense, personal, authentic experiences. I emphasis on authenticity. Um, when you're doing something like um, giving a witnessed cremation, meaning the people are, are present for the ceremony and you're actually um, doing the cremation for them, in front of them, um, and just being there in these really important, potent human moments and trying to bring that sense of authenticity and that, that sort of invisible thing that really connects us into a musical experience. Uh, so we uh, clearly have three very uh, diverse uh, artists uh, in front of us. Um, I think, Luli, you uh, may have uh, addressed to, the, to some extent the next question that I had, which is uh, how uh, rituals and substances and uh, altered states of consciousness uh, affect your uh, practice? And perhaps we start with what the USA. Um, well, let's say uh, to me that the uh, substances topic in particular is something kind of, let's say, optional, meaning like uh, substance, of course, can be a um, quick, uh, let's say, way to achieve certain state of consciousness, let's say, but um, at least by my experience, I know that uh, that's not the only way, you know, that uh, with enough practice and discipline of, um, let's say, other kind of paths, um, you can achieve a very similar result, let's say. There is one uh, main difference that I noticed even when I experimented with myself in one or the other way also in the studio making music is that uh, in one, let's say, you make your own way, so somehow there is still your like uh, ego around what you are doing, controlling somehow rationally or uh, almost rationally what's, uh, what's your output. And uh, in the other case, uh, you don't have that. You're more like a subject to something that feels it's not really you. Then it is actually you just on a much less uh, intelligible level, let's say. So for me, um, it's very interesting to play and experiment on both sides as uh, in the same way as I am I don't find, I don't know, some, some people often, because uh, today, for example, it's going to be about sound bathing and meditating and pranayama, and sometimes people ask me, like, uh, how, how do you reconcile do those two completely different things, like uh, uh, making a burger and closing for 13 hours, and then, like, on Wednesday, go and do your meditation class and stuff. To me, it's not like... Uh, you know, uh, that my practices in terms of pranayama <coughs> and meditations is like uh, about like recovering from that. It's really part of the same organism, honestly. Like uh, I even have uh, sincerely very similar feelings when I was speaking about lack of control, you know. Um, let's say particularly when I, when I play, you know, and there's like that particularly magic moment happening. It's a moment where I lose myself when if people really ask me just after my set, what was the track you played just like 10 minutes ago? I have no idea because I can't remember. It's like really reaching an altered state where you become somehow, I don't know, a medium of what? Surely a medium. I don't know if it's uh, something vertical or something that is so deep inside that is once again not uh, intelligible, you know, and not readable um, using normal, let's say, um, cognitive lucid vocabulary. Uh, but uh, surely the result is the same, that you step out from a convention or from a conventional way of uh, thinking and acting, you know. So for me, the whole thing that is about the meditation on uh, when I play my DJ sets in clubs and playing techno or uh, when I actually make my music, it's still the same thing of like kind of escaping this uh, 
linear, horizontal uh, shape of reality that we are locked in, you know, like waking up, going to work, to earn your money, uh, to be able to eat and sustain you and maybe your family, and then going to sleep again and waking up again, and that's your life. It's like, for me, that's just not enough. <laughs> like, I, I can't... Uh, if I reduce everything to that, that's uh, simply not enough for what I, what, what I need uh, to, to, um, to output to the outside, you know? And so all these practices, that is like the meditation, the DJ sets, the productions of music, it's like about uh, finding this more like vertical line of things where you like step out of that settings in all senses, socially in terms of like perception of time, you know, and how time passes around you, uh, how you can expand it or condense it, let's say, um, um, economically even, because in that moment, yeah, of course, one can argue like, uh, um, uh, you know, money is everywhere, you know, and like really shape our mind, form our mind. We are in a very uh, pervasive system of things, so of course it's everywhere. But that exact moment, it's not there, you know, and that's why it's so special. That's why also techno has been such a, um, such a trigger for also the world community, you know, because uh, it, uh, it triggers a different sphere of things where like things that normally do not meet together, they actually do and everything is fine in that setting, you know, that's, uh, that's my, my, my view on it and how really not different I see those, uh, those words actually, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Uh, yeah, I really like this idea of the criticizing linearity that you talked about. I guess I will come back to this at some point. Um, I think a part of my work addresses this kind of division between body and mind, in a way. Um, for instance, I just released this album that is called uh, Multivocal on Important Records. And uh, this was made for a sleeping event. Um, I had to play two hours. And the idea is to have a set of impulses that have um, one millisecond difference in between. So it starts as a chord and then it slowly develops and every second the rhythm is different. Um, so it's really about repetition and trying to understand the rhythm, but yet the rhythm changes every second. Um, I think I'm really interested by this idea of uh, really engaging uh, with the music in a durational way, let's say. Um, and also not really consuming it in a way. Th this is why, for example, we talked about different uh, format possible for this release and then we chose vinyl. And of course the vinyl is uh, coming back in style now, but I thought it makes sense also because um, at least for me, it changes my way of consuming music. Now, if I put the vinyl, I don't skip through the tracks, for example. Um, and I really sit through the whole experience and it kind of became a ritual for me uh, in my daily life. And I'm really interested in this idea of uh, rituals. Um, for instance, one of my inspiration is the music from the Pygmy that you find in Cameroon and North Congo. And it's really interesting um, polyphonic music I work a lot with polyphony and polyrhythm, um, but also the way they use music is um, punctuating their daily life. So I don't really do this since I perform in, uh, how can I say that, mm, professional setting or concert setting. Um, but in addressing this idea of sleep, which is also an alternate state of consciousness in a way, um, I try to make a link with this idea of the the, the daily life and the ritual in daily life. Um, I think otherwise, um, I'm really interested in working um, with the physical aspect, physi sorry, physical affects in my performances. This is why I like to play loud, for instance. Um, but also I play with different type of tunings. Um, and also this is why I use rhythm, because I think rhythm, there's a mathematical aspect to rhythm, but most of the people react with their body to it, which I found really interesting. So even though you can use really complicated um, polyrhythm or computer-generated computer rhythms, random, randomized, etc., um, people will always understand it directly with their body somehow. So I'm also interested in addressing um, knowledge that is not communicated through words there. 
Um, and also I really like this idea of trends as a way to um, deliver yourself from also the oppression of this daily life that you were talking about before. Um, and I have a link through this, for example. Um, uh, one part of my family is from Cameroon, and uh, I used to, I went a few times to the evangelist church, for example, where there were a lot of trends, and I always saw it, even though I'm not evangelist myself, I'm not a believer, but I always saw it as a way to um, come by, coming back to your roots, because there's a certain reason why this religion was brought there, it's also a tool of oppression, but um, I always saw it as... Um, yeah, a way to become master again of your body, in a way. Um, yeah, maybe we'll talk about this again later. Um, okay, so I'm an audio professional. You, you can tell because I made some notes and they say, be prepared. And then the second set of notes, it just says, don't show them your notes because they're going to know you're a phony, which is <laughs> it's true. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just doing things. Um, but I am going to touch on the things that, that both of these people were talking about a little bit in the sense that um, I think hypnosis is something that's a commonality between all of us and not just us as artists, but all of you, every single one of you right now is in a hypnotic trance of your own kind from culture, from your own identity, from your beliefs and your perspectives. Um, and so there is really no escape from hip hypnotic trance. And so something we do as artists a lot of the time is we try to get you out of whatever trance that you are in currently. Right now, you are in a trance. And by doing things that are either impressive energetically or unconventional in ways that are interruptive, you can snap people out of that, but they can't go out of that into nothing. They go out of that into a different trance. And this is where, where the sort of flavor of the artist comes and you get the sort of um, permission and consent to be able to guide people into a different trance state from where they are into something that may be um, an outside perspective reflecting back on where you were prior or maybe something that completely liberates you from your confines of identity and, and um, belief and all of your social situations that you're in outside of the event. Um, so in, in the PSYCOR world, we've, we've pretty much stopped calling the events parties. Um, we've stopped calling them raves, we've stopped calling them um, festivals and they really just straight up call them rituals now and this is something that a lot of the other electronic music world they really don't like what we're doing because it feels exclusive and limiting to them um, but this is really to sort of create um, a more ritualistic uh, um, like setting for the dance ritual to be something in which you can step into these spaces and you can really let go of the other hypnotic trances that you were in outside of that um, and so um, I'll, I'll do something like play an 11 hour long set um, and this is, this is done in a specific way because you can really guide the entire psychedelic experience and lots of people are pushing themselves to utter extremes with substances or just with dance, just with, you know, um, days straight of high paced dance and without there being the like, mm, maybe if I look sexy or who's watching me or any of this stuff, it's more just really trying to break out of where you were and, and feel what you are without all that extra stuff that you got collected onto you out in society. Um, and on a more personal level, um, my, my own relationship with ritual is, um, I, when I'm getting ready for a set, I'm much less preparing my music and my technology and get everything um, organized so that I can make no mistakes and put on the best image. I'm more trying to condition my energy to be something in which I can do um, what was mentioned before and really become like a medium, really also along with everybody else, get myself out of that trance state that I can't help be in either. It's not like I'm exempt from these things and you feel that difference when you get up there and you're, you're like nervous and you're like making um, careful moves and then you snap out of it 
you snap into this sort of blank character. You know, you are no longer you. You are no longer your identity. You are just a channel, and this stuff is just flowing through you. Pure, intuitive action just flowing through you. Your eyes rolling back in your head while you're mixing three channels together at the same time, just like... <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Oh, I love that feeling so much. Pure liberation. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think, I think uh, we live in an exciting time where we do have the learnings from traditionalist stuff in the past, but we're getting to rewrite the definitions of things like tradition, and we're getting to hybridize new understandings of this through art and music and the social cultures that come along with it, and every single person's contribution to that, not just the artists, and, and, and there isn't really a separation there. It's, it's a, everybody coming together in this room, playing a part in the output that we get to share back and forth in somewhat of a feedback loop that we all teach each other, this, this new form of evolution. And again, this relates to the next question I have, which is uh, what are the uh, philosophies and uh, spiritual and social uh, traditions that have uh, influenced your work? Um, <clears throat> well, I don't think, uh, at least for myself, I can speak of one uh, specific philosophy, let's say. What I can say is that like uh, philosophy, and let's say the um, uh, science of the mind has been something very uh, present for me, like also the way I uh, came into this world was kind of uh, not exactly oh, I want to be a DJ, I'm going to move to Berlin, I hope it's going to happen for me. Like, it's, uh, it was really something completely else. I was in a, a like, PhD university kind of career, and then, like, doing music as a um, side thing that was always present in my life, and then, like, something came transversally, and I just, like, jumped in, let's say. So um, it's not that there is like one specific approach that inform my things. Aside, once again, this, uh, this will a little bit of uh, stepping out of uh, conventional spaces to like create uh, um, spaces that I would almost say like an um, anarchoid space, let's say, where, where normal rules applied to everyday life just, uh, just flip somehow. And it's not that, um, let's say, there are no rules in that world. There are, and they're also uh, pretty rigid sometimes, you know? Like also, the, the, as we all know nowadays, like the anti-conventional can become extremely fashionable you know like so and uh, and in my opinion because of that uh, problem we were speaking about or how pervasive the system around us can be let's say i can always see that this uh, big game of uh, uh, mainstream against underground culture and this like oscillation it keeps flipping and say uh, every time there is uh, that this uh, some s like strength or wave of energy start to come from the underground and start to shape up into something uh, very significant, somehow nowadays even more than before gets immediately absorbed, metabolized, and becomes part of uh, what you were standing against a few years back. You know what I mean? So that kind of balance is something I'm always extremely careful that's why as much as i understand and that's the first feeling uh, i had when i heard the word ritual many times today already i'm always like try to be extremely careful with that i'm uh, uh, because i'm i'm almost like scared that immediately as soon as uh, we give it uh, too big of a shape too big of a structure that starts to be recognized as a structure and as a powerful object, uh, it will become eaten up immediately. That's why, to be honest, this is the very first time I, ac I accepted to make my sound bath outside uh, a small yoga school setting. Um, and I've been asked many times, I'm, I always been like, mm, but this time I did it because the panel was sounding interesting and through the lecture, I could specify a bit of these things to make uh, somehow make I don't know how to say it. maybe I'm paranoid, but make people alert about it, you know, because I've um, 
I've seen you know, that this last few years, this, uh, uh, let's say, image of the, the DJ, the artist, almost as this like, new neo-shaman, you know? And it's something not even uh, so new, it's something that uh, we have all seen happening in the new age culture as well, you know? And that, to me, didn't bring anything good at all. Like, uh, and I mean, I love some of the new age stuff, but I'm speaking in terms of like, uh, uh, position in the artistic world in terms of like uh, society and uh, keep like I don't know a critical mind you know it's uh, it's very dangerous let's say as a process so I always try to go at least in these things where I um, where I'm not forced to face also a whole business world, as I am forced to if I make a living out of my music normally um, at least in this uh, part of it to go really on the on the tip on the tippy toes, you know, in in the room. Let's say, yeah. Um, I think there's also not one specific ritual or philosophy that influences me. Um, I mentioned some of the kind of ritual that interests me before, but I think what interests me there is um, the aspect of collectivity. Also, I really like this idea of. Uh, in those moments, the dissolution of the individual into the collective. Um, but also, um, I like how this brings new perspective on the complexity that a human being is as well. Uh, I don't know, I would give the example of uh, this summer I was in Indonesia and then I went to see a lot of uh, Jetiland show, um, which involve trans also in it. And I've been explained that um, what happens is that the devil's side of yourself is coming to um, uh, take control of your body. And I like this idea that um, it's just, uh, this devil part is just a natural part of yourself somehow. And um, yeah, in general, I found that I like this idea of uh, catharsis as well, somehow. Um, um, and I mean, I said before that I like this idea of collectivity. I mean, I'm still a um, solo artist, actually. <laughs> um, but this is why I try to not, uh, I would say, I would like, I like to play in the dark, for example, or more in darkness to have less emphasis on myself, etc. Um, but I think, yeah, for me, the, the most interesting part there is what kind of, um, uh, ideas it brings in terms of uh, collectivity or what kind of possibilities there is there. That's what I can say. Um, oh, oh, good. I figured it out. Um, yeah, so I've had this kind of um, unconventional relationship with knowledge and with influence um, in a way that I've, I've um, sort of intuitively, specifically tried to reject as much of it as possible. And this has ironically led to a different kind of intelligence. Um, so um, something like um, interacting with intellectual friends and um, having um, these, these sorts of uh, ways of uh, engaging on an intelligent level, but then when they find out I specifically don't read books, I specifically you know, do all these things that are considered you know, to be looked down upon, um, what this has actually done is created a space in which um, this, the, these blanks can be filled in with a, a somewhat authentic, you know, the, the, the concept of authenticity is, uh, is, is even a, one that can easily be challenged, but um, a more authentic sort of personal relationship uh, with philosophies. So instead of uh, reading a book and being influenced by something and being like, yeah, I feel that that person came up with a good thing, I'm gonna keep it. Um, I've more just gone out into the world and learned what I've learned through observation, through making mistakes, big mistakes, many of them. Um, and, um, and so I've, I've developed sort of my own sort of abstract form of spirituality. And, um, and, and um, this, I think, is, has been one of my greater strengths, uh, on, on at least on, on my own understanding. Um, and, uh, hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the rest of the question, so I'm just going to pass it off. Okay, so um, I'm sure that there are a lot of people here who are interested in uh, what uh, the 
desirable outcomes are uh, in terms of the, the impact of your art and your music uh, and your work on, on uh, dance floors and on your audience I mean, and, and, and the dance floor in particular. So you mean in terms of like what we wish what, what, to what have? What your intention is, and, yeah, and, and, okay. and perhaps also uh, you could also talk about whether whether your uh, whether those uh, intentions have been uh, reached, whether those goals have been reached, and uh, whether you're satisfied with uh, the, the the reactions and the 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 impact. Um, well, I think uh, let's say on one side, like when. I hear that question comes like a massive list of things, but uh, let's say to reduce it as much as possible, that's something you actually said before, you said like, uh, I like this process of catharsis. Yeah, like the word catharsis for me has been like incredibly interesting over the years, you know, it's also something that uh, comes from my own native culture. You know, I was born in the very deep south of Italy, um, in Sicily, where we've been like heavily influenced by, let's say our roots are into the uh, Greeks, let's say. So uh, catharsis was actually a, a, a Greek method, let's say, of art, and was particularly special in terms of like their way of making theater, that has been probably the highest peak of their artistic culture. And uh, they were they were all focused on the, on so-called tragedies, you know, Greek tragedies. And the the whole point of it, even if these stories are like uh, heartbreaking, uh, the most horrible, uh, the hero has the most horrible destinies. It's like super painful to go through each one of them. There was this one process that was the the actual point. There was the one of catharsis. There is like, uh, you know, if I, as an artist, put all that like uh, crazy, horrible feelings out into an artistic shape. In their case, it was a piece of theater. And I show to the public how heavy, how hardcore, how extreme it can go. You will automatically create a process of it's out of ourself. Like socially, it's like a purification ritual, talking about ritual, like where it's like uh, through representing it in the worst possible way, uh, you make it, um, you make it um, impossible to affect you really, you know? And to me, on one side, that is based on a dichotomy between like good and bad, you know? And I don't even really believe in that, you know? Uh, but they're like, uh, infinite scales of grace in, in between. Uh, but let's say, if you think uh, about like how, for example, um, uh, inclusivity, you know, uh, sex positive parties, um, BDSM community, like all of that as ensemble of things that has been integral part of uh, the techno rave community, you know, it's something that creates tolerance. Those are the places where like violence, rape culture, sexism, it's pretty much absent, you know? Like that's, uh, that's what it, and uh, to, to me it's always uh, interesting when you bring a failing logic, like the classic kind of uh, average bourgeois logic to the extreme, and present it like that, all the all its strength simply fall to the ground, you know, and that's when interesting things start to start to rise. So I guess like what I try to do in my sets, um, uh, particularly now I had in mind like really the uh, you were speaking about impact on the dance floor, like about like just the moment where I'm DJing, but somehow even in making music and uh, and all of that, it's like really to just favorite a bit that happening somehow, like to give it a sonic frame that makes sense for that to happen, you know, for that uh, archetype destruction, let's say, yeah, so. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I think um, there's not one specific uh, desired outcome I wish beside of uh, maybe 
feeling something instead of only understanding, for example. I'm interested in this, and this is where I this resonates in me. What you said before, this idea of uh, rather experiencing things, uh, f yeah, for live the experience rather than reading them, and rather than theory. Um, and I actually my my expectation is to be also surprised. I'm often really surprised by how people projected themselves in the, in what I do and uh, the sort of projection that they had. Sometimes they tell me things that um, were not there for me, but it's actually there also because what I do is also beyond my own intention as an artist sometimes. Um, um, yeah, and so, so this, this um, I'm kind of coming back to what I said at the beginning with this idea of um, transmitting some complex idea through bodily knowledge. And uh, sometimes I had some talks with people that don't have this background or don't really understand the concepts that are behind, but they understood it actually through their own word, through their own experience. And uh, for me, this is the best outcome, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah I, think, I think the concept of catharsis is something that runs through a lot of things. So rather than be more redundant on that matter, that's definitely part of it. Um, on, on a physical level, I really love when, through um, getting into such a diversity of styles, speeds, aesthetics, um, intensity levels, you can really bring a person out of just like their normal like, like routine sort of dance and you can push them into new ways of acting. And, and, and we see this as dance, but body language is a language. And this, this language is linked to our emotions in a way that you can sort of have a two-way communicative medium. Something like going from sitting like this and having that condition your energy in one way to puffing up and getting confident in your physical state, your performing confidence, and you suddenly emotionally feel this. Um, so through the dance experiences, um, you can stay introverted in your own little personal state. But what I love seeing the most is when through the variety, you see people exploring their own physical variety in these new ways that they've never thought to uh, be before. And, and I relate this to sort of, I don't know if you've ever had that old cell phone thing where um, it doesn't understand where it is in space, so you have to like swirl it all around so that it finds itself and it calibrates itself. Every single position of our body is a new communication. And through dance, we can explore every single possible position, every single rhythm, and, and um, every single emotional expression. You know, uh, on the catharsis tip, there's something like you can just go from like dancing and grooving and feeling your groove to just like really stamping out your deepest traumas without having to tell them to anyone and get judged for them. And, and, and so when I see this happening, that's, that's what I feel inspired by as an artist, not just facilitating a dance party, but really facilitating people to explore themselves outside of the containment of themselves and break past all the inhibitions and fears and, and self-awareness that is actually somewhat more oppressive than a lot of social oppression that exists. You know, the, the, the ways in which we keep ourselves inhibited by uh, ill understandings of ourselves or fearful um, fearful projections of what might happen if we are to really break out of our shell. Um, and yeah, so on a physical level and an emotional level, I, I find these things linked. Um, and above all, user experience is the best and everyone should just figure out their own personal way to use the setting, to use the ritual, to use the music. And that is what happens ultimately. Um, and, and yeah, I'm just happy to play a part in that along with everybody. Uh, the last question I have before uh, we'll open up to uh, some questions from the audience is uh, how uh, does your work relate to contemporary society? It would be um, a little bit redundant, but I think it's something I, I touched in the previous question that is like once again like a little bit this feeling of uh, yeah needing to create uh, a subspace in the normal space of things, let's say, uh, where rules are slightly different, you know? It's a little bit like the 
um, Alice in Wonderland story, you know, where it's like uh, um, out of a normal setting you can create with your own, uh, let's say, artistic power, a different like uh, bubble, you know. Um, but as I, I think I kind of answered that at least uh, for what relates to me uh, before, I, I think I will leave uh, uh, more space to them to express it as well. Yeah, I also think I sort of answered it, but uh, I would say maybe one other important aspect is, uh, that I like is learning to be in the moment also, really living the experience, uh, not trying to, as I said, understanding with your mind what is going on and uh, beside of what is happening in this room. Um, and yeah, I think let's say being more mindful, even though it's kind of connotated to use the word mindful, but I don't use it in this way. Um, and I think also in general, I, with my own music, I really don't like so much technological fetishism, for example. Uh, so this is why I'm kind of really minimalistic with my setup. Um, but I think the, 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 the core of what I do is really about this, this idea of the communal experience somehow and feeling also linked to, not only in the moment, but also to each other in the room. Yeah. Um, to sort of touch back on what was said earlier about dissolving um, the individual into the collective. Um, so another, another uh, desired outcome that has more of a societal implication is this is what would really happen um, if we were to be able to break down a lot of these barriers that are keeping us in more individualistic and isolated states. Um, and technology is doing a lot to reinforce this quarantine of the self and keep us from actually really connecting with each other. Um, and and uh, if, if you've just ever sat and thought about it um, when you're thinking about politics or society or evolution and you start thinking, wow, what could we do if we were actually unified and working together on some of these things rather than just being so wrapped up in our own personal stories and, and images? Um, so there really is, uh, through all kinds of dance music culture, through all different kinds of um, subcultures that, that we can all join in together, um, there is the potential to um, sort of give the, the initial uh, petri dish inoculations to this kind of thinking where, where our differences really are not as important as us all coming together and doing this one same thing. Even if we're all doing it in a slightly different way, there is that undercurrent of unity. Um, and on the same note, with the catharsis and with the, um, the you know, exploring yourself and breaking out of your old shell, um, on the same note, I've seen personally in my own life just such a huge difference from how I used to think about myself um, and how I took all of my um, understanding of myself from my outside environment and the reflections I got from other people and from society and from authoritarians and how this put me into a really disempowered state of being to where um, I really didn't see myself as worth very much as an individual. I didn't see myself as having valuable perspective to contribute or as somebody who was intelligent or as somebody who was beautiful or somebody who had really any value in the greater societal context. Um, and then having the sorts of changes of mind that I went through personally through music culture and through the performance and the ritual and especially through the feedback from people of being like, no, you're, you're, you're really doing something that is valuable. And, and then me being like, no, you're doing that for me too. You know, I go from my horrible life living in the gutters of LA in a car, struggling with money, eating one taco a day and having one Coke, and then get on a plane and go to Brazil and have 200 people be like, ah, we love you, <laughs> and, and go home being like, okay, I can do this. Um, and, and then after enough times of having that happen, um, then you really start to believe in yourself. And, and each and every single one of us can rise to a greater level of confidence. And in these greater levels of confidence, we're so much more capable uh, at doing all of the things we do and doing it more potently. We're so much more capable of the kinds of vulnerability that is needed to connect and that's needed to have that unity, is, is to, to sort of have that um, confidence in yourself to not have to protect yourself socially against every single one of the other people who are all actually on the same team as you. 
Wonderful. Um, we, we have a few minutes, uh, or quite a few minutes for uh, questions. So uh, we'll move to uh, Q&A. So if you have a question that, um, for uh, either of our three guests or preferably something that might be answered by all of them, uh, please raise your hands. And I think there's going to be a microphone passed around. We have a question at the front here. Yeah, thank you all for the wonderful contributions. Um, I wondered if you can say something about the time factor in your work. I mean, um, how, how much the time span that you have at hand to perform, channel, mediate, and so on, uh, is an important factor. And how much do you feel, let's say, the configurations of the places and the settings and the the business, so to say, in which you have to perform limits to limits what you actually would want to do by restricting these times that you have at hand to actually do what you want to do in the performance space. I mean, you know, the yeah. Um, I, I, I definitely notice a, a wide variety of impacts because, as I had roughly mentioned, sometimes when I go somewhere like Brazil and they're, they're booking me for a ritual, they, they want like a 12-hour live set or something like that. There are even people, um, I cannot do this, but there are, there are people who are on my label or that I'm friends with that play for 24 hours of DJing nonstop. And, um, in, in, that, in that time frame, you really get to explore lots of different states more and you get to go up and down and, and into a whole bunch of different directions. Whereas whenever I've got like an hour to play, it's more just like, go full throttle, do your thing, and then you're done. And it's sort of like this hit and run experience, which um, that's great too, because you get a wider diversity through the night. You don't just have one, play, one person playing the whole entire time. So I think each thing has its strength and its weakness. Um, and, and there, there definitely is, um, with the business factor, um, there's a lot more, uh, once you start getting paid for something and, 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 you're, and they're selling tickets for it, um, then there's a lot more of a sort of a dynamic of, uh, we want you to do what's gonna make it worth our money or something like that. And, and this really does make you more play for the dance floor, or play your, your, you know, the biggest hits or whatever a lot of the time. Um, whereas if somebody's like, hey, we're just going to go get some poor quality speakers and go under this bridge, can you just do whatever? Um, it really gets you into um, a more free space and you can, you can um, express yourself without any concern for letting anybody down financially or whatever. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I think that, um, I, I, yeah, with so many things, there's just strengths and weaknesses to each different um, place and time frame? Um, I think maybe f for me one limitation is sometimes the discourse that you have to need to have on top of what you do because uh, if I need to create something new for example I rarely know what I'm doing until I've done it for instance so I'm not really able to always communicate my idea in the process um, and also because sometimes you also need uh, rooms to try it out to fail actually um, this need of failing maybe is uh, definitely a limitation, I think, once you, as you said, you start to earn money, etc. But it's totally part of, uh, part of the process. Um, this is the main limitation, I think, for me at the moment. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, picking up on what you actually said, like, about the... Uh, about the business side of things, like uh, you were saying, like uh, you know, when uh, when you start to get paid for something, like the dynamic changes completely. But to me, somehow that is also the interesting part, you know. Like somehow, like I maybe now I'm a little more used to it. But I remember like the very first times that I don't know festivals like Time Warp or Awakenings were booking me. I was really wondering, like why the fuck are they booking me with the music I do? Like, I really have no idea for the um, average output that I hear. And in the end, as at the beginning, I was really feeling for years like a little bit this, uh, I don't know, fish out of the water feeling, you know? At some point, I started to, I don't know, have fun into playing with those dynamics. And I'm like, okay, if I understand 
that kind of code, that kind of language, and I can uh, sneak in my messages inside that uh, code and languages, uh, that's what I call a success, you know what I mean? And um, I don't know, I know that that could be somehow, maybe on a very shallow level, seen as um, uh, compromising on things, but I don't know, to me, it really isn't. It's a little bit like the... Um, the, the difference between, um, oh, I don't know, when you are like a teenage and you write your own uh, diary for yourself in that kind of very beautiful, powerful, instinctive, immediate language. And uh, um, I don't know, when you become a writer, you decide to write a whole cathedral composition novel, you know, like that's, uh, that's for me when things get interesting and um, not just because of this, but because they, uh, to me, projects to be sensible, to not be, uh, let's say, self-referential, somehow they have to become self-sustainable, you know? Somehow they, because self-sustainable in all senses, that it's like an artistic project, a record label, an artistic career, or a, a house, you know, that you build to be self-sustainable and uh, ecologically, like, zero impact. It's a bit the same dynamic of, like, uh, not becoming a vampire of something, like meaning like uh, it's not like a scene that vampirizes you as an artist, nor you that vampirizes on a scene, but it starts to become like a, I don't know, an interesting flow of things, you know, and ideas. That's, uh, yeah. Um, this. Hello. Oh God, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try to be clear. I think my question um, is about also your opinion on the role of dancers as channelers, because this is something that I've heard here in the panel, this feeling sensation, which I totally agree with, of like, it is a processing and it's a mode of channeling. And I'm, I feel um, a lot that there's like now a very strong interest from like, uh, the dance, contemporary dance field to bring DJs into theaters. But I always wonder what is the connection between DJs and dancers, whereas there's any ideas, wills, desires, or thoughts uh, upon this. Because like, yeah, the DJ is playing, the dancers pay to get in. And sometimes, a lot of times, I feel like I'm paying to work because I pay like 20 euro to get in this club and I'm fucking working like with, together with the, with the DJ, with all the other ravers and people around. And yeah, I was just wondering, like, <laughs> what are some thoughts on this also? Yeah. Certainly, it's, it's very, um, it's impossible to ignore that uh, without the dancers present, aside from the money aspect, you're just up there playing music to the air. Um, and, and, and so there's a, a very significant feedback loop factor um, between DJs and the dancers. And I think the dynamic of channeling um, in which you have to sort of go blank in yourself and get that sort of out-of-body experience, this is something that's common uh, throughout anyone present at the ritual or, or rave or whatever. Um, and, and I know from myself, from being a dancer as well, um, that you have the same sort of experience where you go from like being self-conscious and being aware of your moves to just like completely just intuitive action. Um, and it, it really, there, there is no separation ultimately. There's this, there's this cultural illusion that the DJs are doing this thing and everyone's like, you know, receiving it. But no, it's just everybody is going there with output. It's just that a couple people have a different role and this really doesn't make them more significant. In the end, um, a whole room full of dancers could go up and just go put some mix on on SoundCloud and just pfft, go crazy and have just as powerful of a ritualistic experience a lot of the time. Um, so so I, think, um, I, I think if anything, it's, it's a real privilege to be able to have the community support, to have all these people be like, we want you to do what you do so that we can do what we do together. I think just to clarify, I was wondering if you as artists and DJs have ever thought, for instance, to tour 
with like one or two other people who are also, you know, for instance, the, if there are kind of ways of sometimes tricking and hacking a little bit, like the system of the, the, the DJ that goes and tours, what is it to every time? I mean, of course, I know the market doesn't really pay for so many flights and trips for more than one person. Uh, that's always a complication, but I've always wondered like what are modes of maybe sometimes also including uh, within sets or within artistic modes of doing DJing, etc. Like. So you mean to travel with dancers? Imagine, yeah. with one or yeah. two people that are infiltrated dancers that you know, <laughs> that you trust, maybe they change in every time, maybe, you know, like, but because also as channelers, sometimes I know I have friends who are DJs and I connect in specific ways with them. Some, you know, I was just wondering, like, <laughs> ways or interesting modes of hacking. So, okay. Yeah, I... Uh I, I recently actually something very interesting about it. Like it's uh, this uh, act. I don't know if you're familiar with it, called uh, Gabber Eleganza. Um, it's this. Um, yeah, it, it's a very interesting project. That and uh, this guy put together a show called uh, I think it's called the Hacke Show. Yeah, uh, where he took like this kind of classic Gabber Hacke dance aesthetic and started to not really bring his own dancers, but to uh, the places where he goes, uh, he spontaneously asks the community, like, if there's someone that can dance, Hacke, please come to the show and dance. So that, that's, uh, for me, a super nice uh, way of, of uh, I found it a super fresh idea. I just wanted to give this, uh, this little input, yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's 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 a lot of creative potential in making collaborations like that, though it isn't something you see very often. Um, but even just being at an event in which somebody is really free with their dancing, um, they can they can influence the entire dance floor. Um, and if you could really create some sort of artistic collaboration between the dancers and the music, um, it would it would be a more full spectrum uh, expression, um, and it would be more immersive, I think, for the people there. Um, I, I would love to see that more often, but you're right, it isn't something that um, is, is very often done, but that's also inspiring because that gives room for exploring these things. I, mean, yeah, I don't really answer because I don't do club music, so I don't, yeah. <laughs> you can definitely dance to non-club music. That's that's a, there's, a, there's a hand here. Wait for the mic. Um, you were talking about this being your first sound bath that you're performing and accepting this invitation um, and, and the sort of need to be careful around the semantics of creating these rituals in different contexts. So you're a DJ playing big clubs and then you're also doing a different type of thing where you're putting people in a type of catharsis um, and maybe they have kind of more inward journeys in, in well, I'm not sure if there, is there a difference that you're finding in your intention for the um, more kind of like party setting versus, mm -hmm. and I guess this is a question that applies to all of you, like versus a, a kind of controlled meditative type of framing of this, yeah. of this event. I, I don't think it's, um, you know why I don't see a difference in the intention because of, um, you just said that more, um, if there's a difference in a more controlled environment, I don't think that one is more controlled than the other. In both cases, the only thing I do, both as a DJ, as a producer, when you happen to listen to my album or something, or during a session, is what I do is to simply give tools. I give a frame. I give a circumstance. Then it's up to what's happening inside. It's really out of my control. This, we, we go back to the dancer thing that they were talking about, you know, like that's the same. What I do is to give a frame what happened to the dancing inside and to the super interesting feedback loop that uh, they were talking about. Like th that's uh, another story, but that is um, the kind of control or non-control level is pretty much the same. That's why also the intention somehow is very similar. Like uh, that is uh, um, also because if you think about sometimes like people can see, for example, meditation and this kind of practice as something that is really like inward, you know, I honestly see like uh, the techno dancing experience uh, very lonely and inward as well, you know, like uh, 
But if you think about like there's a similar dynamic in both, meaning like this uh, experience of like uh, collective uh, solitude, you know, like that is like uh, you are losing your shit in that dance floor and you're doing it on your own, just like going for it and losing your, your, your control, you know, because you have all those other individuals in their solitude around you as well. So it's relatively a isolated state. The same goes with, uh, with a very deep uh, pranayama, like singing session, you know. Uh, it's a very inward method. Yeah, your eyes are closed, you're all focused inward, fully. At the same time, the collective singing around you brings things to a level that it's unachievable on your own, you know? So in that sense, to me, they are, uh, once again, very, very similar dynamics. It's just like different settings, but we are speaking about a very, very superficial level of, uh, of settings. Like inside, where it's really the same, the same cake, let's say, yeah. The question could also be asked, uh, is it possible to experience the vibe at home alone? And uh, I think you're suggesting that perhaps it's, it's impossible. The, uh, I don't know, the I don't think it's a... Alone together. It's maybe it's about, uh, let's say, the fact that we're like home alone and you, again, lose your shit in dancing to something that you find amazing. It's still there's something inside you in your brain in a, in a memory system that works as a recall of what you felt in that rave and experiencing that community, you know? Uh, at least that's my own experience, but I guess that's also something extremely, extremely personal, you know, as, a, um, as, a, um, as an experience, yeah. Um, so we have some, some hands here. Uh. Thank you, everybody. Um, so Graham actually touched on in his talk about the, the ancient um, lineage of, of rave culture and some ecstatic practices in ancient Greece and Rome and the devotees of Dionysus and Bacchus, who were often referred to as these frenzied um, deities or deities that represented ceremonial madness. And when we come into the more contemporary context of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, um, and you know, like Terence McKenna talking about every psychedelic experience being an act of courage, um, where does danger play in your work? Because a lot of these ec ecstatic practices are have a real serious elements of danger involved in them, and that's what makes them also very exciting and appealing. And that's that's where like room for growth appears. But what is, your, what is your take and integration of danger in your work, whether performing or whether or while designing? Um, on, a, on a personal level, I've, I've definitely pushed myself to my utter extents um, and looked over that cliff into death's face over and over and over again. Not something that I advocate. I've gotten very lucky to have survived all of those times. Um, and so with that learning though, you can use that sort of feeling and, and the near death experience is one of the absolute most psychedelic experiences possible. It does this thing for just lifting the veil on all these aspects of your life, reorienting your value system, making you realize what's really important. Um, and oftentimes this is a huge illus illusory um, shattering. You're like, oh wait, it's all these little things that I take for granted that are important and all the big exciting things, they're actually disposable. Um, and so creating these sorts of states of danger um, I, I think this is something that can be done synthetically too, which is why a lot of my music really pushes the boundaries of what is acceptable to put in music. Some, some just utterly like violent, screaming, um, like perverse, disgusting moments. Um, and, and that's intended to really make people on the dance floor go from being like, I'm just raving, I know what I'm doing, to being like, like, ah, like, what was that? Um, and, and having those, those moments of like, I, I don't know if this is okay. I don't know if it's okay that I like this or that I'm here. Why do these people like this or whatever? Um, that these can be really psychedelic and, and really powerful in breaking people out of their 
infinite trances that they get buried under. Um, and, and there are also just things you can do on a less topical level, which is, you know, not putting like, like edgy samples in or whatever, but really just doing things like pushing the sound system to its, its utter limits in ways that make people think, like, is, is that okay? Or is it broken? Are they, are they like breaking the sound system? There are times in, when I'm playing that I'm like up on the subwoofers, just like jamming the mic into the, into the top and, 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 and people are looking at it like, you can't do that. There was one time when I had a microphone and I went close to the little speaker and it started screaming and I thought it was gonna break the speaker. But really, you've got, a bunch of, you've got a bunch of effects on the microphone. So when it starts screaming, it's changing it and processing it in a way that isn't actually um, going to give that infinite feedback. Um, but it is still going to give this disconcerting feeling of like, is, is that okay that they're doing that? Is, you know, and um, also with that, there's lots of elements of physical performance that you can engage in. And I, I don't do this anymore. Um, but in my younger days when I had, uh, the context was more in like basement punk shows and noise shows and stuff like that. Um, I, I would do things which on some level were a personal um, empowerment ritual, but on other, another level was really intended to just um, like, like uh, have this, um, this experience facilitated in a person where they really felt like they were in ri at risk. They really felt like this person is genuinely out of control and they're not okay right now. I've done things like, like ah, th make myself throw up into a fountain over top of myself and have it rain down on me and then like throwing it on the crowd. I'm sorry to, to the people that have experienced that. Um, <laughs> There, there, there was a time in Rio, in the jungle, and, and this became somewhat of a legendary uh, story um, because there were lots of pictures. Um, but so I, I was supposed to play, uh, this guy had created this new idea for a party where he wanted to cross BDSM culture and Psycor and, and his own sort of like culturally appropriated form of like dark Satanism thing. Um, and he, he completely f failed at facilitating the setting and also left me and other artists with nothing, nothing for nourishment except for vodka and highly caffeinated soda. Um, and so after a bottle and a half of vodka um, <laughs> um, and, and lots of like um, stress going through those situations, um, uh, I, I got up on stage and instead of playing what everybody expected, and this was, all, this was all prefaced, I told everybody this is going to be a different kind of experience. I'm booked to facilitate a physical experience that is going to be a lot more crowd oriented. Um, if you don't want to be touched, if you don't want to be attacked, if you don't want to see this, if you don't feel comfortable with nudity, just either don't show up or go to the back of the dance floor and I'll avoid that area entirely. Um, and it ended up being um, a situation in which, um, oh, this is, I can't believe I'm saying this. So, um, <laughs> so uh, I got up in front of the audience and um, I urinated into a plastic bottle and then I drank the urine and then I spit it up into a fountain all over me, creating this feeling of danger. Oh my God, this person is really genuinely insane. And then after that, running out into the crowd, completely covered in jungle mud, head to toe, and somewhat in urine, but mostly vodka at that point. Um, and just pouncing on people and like there's there's videos and pictures of this and some of you have probably even seen the one picture where I'm inside the the giant speaker stack of a beautiful function one system but I'm completely bare ass naked covered in mud like climbing inside the subwoofer um, and and although <laughs> I will never repeat that experience again um, <laughs> Uh, it definitely left an impact on anyone that was there in a way that was above, <laughs> above and beyond the psychedelic experience with LSD or with the music or with the trance. It was something that was like, like it really snaps you out of these states. And, 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 and from my own personal experiences, there's, there's always been this, this, um, this, this wrongness about something like, like what it was like for me to take too much LSD compared to what it's like to watch a synthetic fractal just do the same thing over and over or whatever. 
Um, and so in, in these really intense psychedelic experiences, there are just so many unexpected things happening constantly, so fast, overwhelmingly fast, overwhelmingly unexpected, something like a really intense DMT trip. You're not like, oh, here we are again, we're doing the thing. It's just like pff, blasting symbols at you and, and giving you this overwhelm of abstract things that you didn't expre uh, expect to experience. And so taking those expectations that people have of this is what's okay to do in a performance setting, this is, this is what's socially acceptable for a human's behavior, this is, this, uh, everybody has these inhibitions and you're not allowed to break these certain things. Um, being somebody who's, who's um, intentionally breaking those things can really create a psychedelic experience that's above and beyond the music or the drugs, it's simply just a socially based one, just like if, if I were to run out into the audience right now and just start pouncing on people, it would create quite, it would create a different mindset in people. I won't do that. <laughs> Anyone? So, um, if Jessica, if you, uh, we we only have a couple of minutes, so uh, a response from you would be would be great, and then uh, then we can finish. Yeah. Uh, no, just shortly, I mean, there's no uh, threat of death in what I do, or <laughs> the body is not involved in this way. Um, but definitely sonically, sometimes I'm pushing a bit some boundaries because it's a bit loud or I'm going into really high frequencies. And in, uh, really often it happens that some people leave the room and some of them are really upset. And uh, for me, I think it's okay because uh, I think it's also really healthy that some people think, okay, I reached my boundaries and I need to go. And uh, I actually enjoy it uh, to see this happening. Yeah, that's it. Uh, please thank our three guests, Luli, Jessica, and Lucy. Let's get bathed. For, for this nice talk and uh, panel discussion. Now we have a 15 minutes break um, and please leave the room